Welcome back to Down the Middle. It's great to be here in New York City, downtown New York. This, the city's vibrant and hopping right now. It's great. It it's, doesn't feel like it's post-pandemic anymore. It feels like New York City. Uh, today we have a different guest than what we've been used to. If you've watched a lot of the episodes, uh, think about the dollar, whether it's digital or part of your Apple Pay or if you're swiping. Uh, we have somebody who's spent an entire career steeped in the knowledge of the dollar and other currencies. Mark Chandler with Bennett Byrne Global Foreign Exchange. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you. You have no idea. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've been doing this for so long that I, I, I always take people back to what got you to where you are. And you could have knocked me over with a feather when you told me that you started off as a wire reporter. I, I just I can't square the circle. Yeah, so what happens is I have, uh, I really got, I had a master's in American history, and to study modern American history really is to study international relations. And so I did a master's in international relations, and when I got out of school, uh, this is uh, in, the, in the mid 80s, uh, this is uh, the Reagan boom, the financial sector mm -hmm. that created a lot of jobs, I mean, by deregulating the capital markets, it created a lot of jobs. I was able, as a liberal arts person, even with advanced degrees, I was able to move into one of those jobs. And so it's to, I knew how to write. And so I was covering the currency futures and the short-term debt futures, euro dollars and T-bills, mm -hmm. from the floor of the, of the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And the year that I joined, it was the year after they were putting up bids and offers for the currencies, currency futures, mm -hmm. on a chalkboard. And wow. now the foreign exchange market is like $6.6 .6 trillion a day, average daily turnover. And it's kind of a wild number because what it means is world trade in a year is only about $30 trillion. Right. And so we see enough, today being Thursday, we see enough foreign exchange turnover this week to cover world trade for a year. So we're going to get back to that because I, I do want you to contextualize the size of the foreign exchange market because I think it's... I think it's the least appreciated aspect of the entire financial system because it's mammoth. Um, but first, let's let's take a walk down what landed you at Brown Brothers six months after my former boss Richard Fisher had left. So let's go back in time and walk through the various places. It's, it's it, it feels like a very very non-random walk down Wall Street that you had. Yeah, sure. So I, I think that. Uh... The issue with journalists is we're supposed to be objective. But uh, if there's anything that a person with a master's degree in American history and international relations has is an opinion. And so I found that as a journalist, I would be more often uh, having my own opinion. And that made me not such a good journalist. Right. And so I found that the markets actually reward people that have an opinion. It doesn't necessarily have to be right. We have to have an opinion that's thought out. Right. And so I went from a journalist to an analyst. And I moved around to different shops, gaining more experience, more responsibility. So I was part of, uh, when I got off the floor of the Chicago Merck, I joined Dean Witter, when it used to be part of Sears. And, uh, That's right. It's oh my gosh. Stocks and socks. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's just gaining more experience and responsibilities and trying to have a, uh, like yourself, have a, try to have a bigger footprint. Yeah. And so I went to different places to get that bigger footprint. And then I, I joined a hedge fund uh, that blew up in Mexico with the tequila crisis in the, the mid-90s. The tequila crisis. And uh, I, I began working for some banks and I moved around to different banks and uh, uh, from HSBC, Deutsche Bank. I had a small stint at Mellon Bank. Mm -hmm. before it was bought by Bank of New York. Right. And uh, I found myself uh, at Brown Brothers, which is one of the last of the partnership banks. You know, the Merrill Lynch's uh, was a partnership, Goldman Sachs partnership. Right. Brown Brothers, to this day, is still a partnership bank. And I, I like that idea of people having skin in the game. And I learned a lot there about uh, value investing. And it's, a, it's an old-fashioned firm, but those old true values so that, for example, during the great financial crisis, Clients brought cash to Brown Brothers, even though it was not FDIC insured. And the reason they did that is because the partners had their own money in the game. They weren't buying these ninja loans, these uh, no-income jobs or assets. Right. Right. They were using their own money. And it, it, I learned a lot there. And, uh, but at the same time, I thought that uh, that I wanted to do is, I thought that for me, one of the biggest problems, challenges we face, not only in the U.S., but many other countries, is the disparity of wealth and income. And at Brown Brothers, it's really for people who have already made it. And I haven't made it yet. And I thought that I wanted to begin helping other people. And so I joined Bannockburn, a small boutique, 
to help small, medium-sized businesses. And this is the amazing thing. You know, we talk about house prices, and how do we know the price of a house? It's somewhere between the bid and the offer. Yeah. Same thing in foreign exchange. And what, what we find is that these large corporations, like S&P 500, the large asset managers, perhaps we have our 401ks or our retirement money, mm -hmm. they might pay on the euro that spread might be at a thousandth of a penny spread. But small and medium-sized businesses pay one or two percentage points. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of inefficiencies that, that I, I think that at Bannockburn and other companies like us try to squeeze out, the, you know, try to improve the transparencies and efficiencies for a part of the market that is often treated like tourists. So give an example mm -hmm. of the, the type of, obviously no names, but mm -hmm. give an example of the type of company you might work with in that, mm -hmm. in that realm, a, a smaller or medium-sized business, why they would have any need for, for for currencies. Yeah, that's the amazing thing. We think of the exports and we, in the U.S. or imports, and of course the economy is dominated by large companies. Right. But so many small and medium-sized businesses are the backbone of the economy. And we often forget them because we think about, of course, the economy is highly concentrated, consolidated industry after industry. Sure. But this, many small and medium-sized businesses buy goods from overseas or sell goods overseas. Mm -hmm. This is why this is why the the whole drive to export is not just about big companies, but a lot of small, medium-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. And so the ones who are oftentimes in manufacturing, buying buying either inputs or selling product overseas, and they they just have currency exposure and they don't necessarily know what to do with it. Interesting. I've, I've got a friend who, who manufactures in India and in China and in Madagascar. I'm going to have to introduce you because that, that sounds like something that, that, that would be great for her. Uh, but I don't. But I've never thought about her business, even though I know she manufactures overseas. I've never thought about how currency would play into her ability to manage the risk. Yeah, that's so important because you think that a lot of these small, medium-sized businesses, like what, what kind of profits do they really make? They're lucky if they make 5% profit margin. Mm -hmm. And yet we can see what's happening in the currency markets where you could lose that overnight. Sure. And so if you don't, so the difference between managing the currency and not managing the currency could be the difference between making a successful product and then losing money. So you mentioned the tequila mm -hmm. crisis. Uh, walk us through what that was, because this was, this was a few years before what a lot of people perceived to be when the Fed became kind of overly intrusive in the financial markets, long-term capital management, 1998. But in 1987, that was when Alan Greenspan had already started to kind of impose himself in the markets to leak information to bond trading desks ahead of Fed moves to inject liquidity into the markets. I mean, these, these were, it was hush-hush, but it started in 1987 with the crash. And it came about again because Orange County blew up. And at the same time, mm -hmm. We had the tequila crisis. So, I mean, I was, I was living in Texas at the time, and I remember it, but walk us through what that was. Yeah, so essentially what a lot of countries do to avoid this currency volatility is they keep their currencies pegged or in a very narrow range. And mm -hmm. Mexico did that, but they had a deteriorating uh, underlying economy. And so they, they lost the ability to defend the currency. And, when they, and so the U.S. got involved as well. Uh, at the time, it was uh, I think it was Robert Rubin at the Treasury, yep. and he had uh, he used the uh, the ESF, the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is half owned by the Treasury, half owned by the Federal Reserve, to try to stabilize and to stabilize the situation because of the blowback to the U.S. Right. And so the tequila crisis was just one of the first currency pegs uh, in uh, modern times, say mid '90s, uh, that uh, that blows up, and it really was a hairbinger of the. Uh, of the other kind of crisis they would have a few years later in Asia, where the same kind of thing took place, pegged currency regimes in a very uh, in a changing uh, dynamic world, volatile world, mm -hmm. hard to maintain that currency peg. And when those pegs break, it's like a dam bursting. Right. And that's what happened with Mexico. Mexico at the time, in the tequila crisis, there's about three pesos to the dollar. Today, there's about 20 to 21 pesos to the dollar. And I was at this hedge fund that blew up over it because the idea was it moves outside the band. Well, officials will work hard to push it back in the band. And so we, we doubled up thinking they were gonna push it back in the band. And instead, they never got it back into the band. Fascinating. Um, and and, and when, you, when you say blowback you know, to the United States, we, we forget, I mean, Mexico's our largest trading partner right now. I think in Mexico, Canada, China. Yeah. So uh, I think it's very important. Our economies are very integrated, even though we are different, like say levels of development or stages of development, mm -hmm. GDP per capita, those kind of measures. Right, right. But me that's the, the U.S. I think cannot have a strong economy if Mexico or Canada are in a recession, or if Europe's in a recession, which might be more the case going forward. 
Well, so before we move on, let's go to the 1997 Asian crisis, because I think, I think we're starting to see some parallels play out in the here and now. But explain yeah. how that kind of, it, it felt at the time kind of like this daisy chain. Yeah, because what was happening is that, so countries want to have a stable currencies. Mm -hmm. And so they have these different regimes, uh, like Hong Kong dollar, still pegged to the US dollar. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, they're pegged to the US dollar. And so they're partly outsourcing their monetary policy to the Federal Reserve. And that works up to a point. Mm -hmm. In East Asia, like in Mexico, it didn't work anymore. And some countries had these large current account deficits, the large broad trade deficits, right. and the currency was artificially high because of the peg or because of the crawling peg or some kind of more rigid regime. And sort of like you know those old stories about the in the uh, 19th century where people tried to corner the wheat market, and how it just over the wheat market, the world grain just overflowed. <clears throat> I think the same thing happens with capital. Mm -hmm. Thailand, Indonesia. Even South Korea was, South Koreans were, the government was asking the women to give their wedding rings, the gold, to melt it down, to, to help the government uh, support, at the time, what would be an artificially high currency. Right. And so I, I think in many ways, the, the toppling of these rigid currency regimes is part of this ushering in this new world that, for me, it, began, it begins with Reagan and Thatcher, un, deregulating the capital markets, unleashing like trillions of dollars over cross-border transactions. And this all, it was too much for these rigid regimes. We, in, a, in a world that has highly mobile capital, you need to have different shock absorbers. Right. And a floating exchange rate can act as that shock absorber. But when you've got a lot of vested interest in a pegged regime, when it breaks, it really, it's sort of like when they say more in salt, when it rains, it pours. Right, right. Take us to kind of where we, uh, I, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about reserve currency status and what it means. And it's a subject that comes up more and more, and there, the terminology is, is, is cited more and more, but I think that there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what it means, how the United States got the reserve currency status, uh, and why, for example, British pound sterling, which was its predecessor, fell, and what it would take to lose reserve currency status. Because to me, at least, if, if you could walk us through the history, to me, I think it's, it's risky to, to just kind of willy-nilly talk about it as if it could happen tomorrow. I think maybe you can help people understand that it is a process and a very long, drawn-out one. Yeah, central banks really move at glacial speeds. Because the reserves are accumulated through intervention in the foreign exchange market, like Japan or China. They don't want their currency to appreciate, so they intervene. And by intervening, I mean they, they end up uh, selling their currency, weakening it, and buying the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. So countries like, so you think about those reserves in the world. They're highly concentrated in about 10 countries, mm -hmm. including Japan, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Uh, would be the, among the biggest holders. Uh, Saudi Arabia is in the top 10 with about $450 billion. Put that in perspective. So for context sake, China's, China about, and Japan are... Ch China's got about $3 trillion in reserves, mm -hmm. and Japan's got a little bit more than $1 trillion. Those are the two biggest. And, but China's separated out between euros and, and dollars. Uh, yeah, so, also, so central banks, we, they don't, we don't really know. It's almost regarded as a state secret, for the most part, what, how an individual country's reserves are allocated between mm -hmm. dollars, euros... Japanese yen, British pounds, even Chinese yuan. But so what, what, what people like me look for is that the IMF, they have a database regarded as the most authoritative source on reserves mm -hmm. called COFER, the, uh, if they're measure. And you, you could Google it if you sure. wish. And they'll give you every quarter with a quarter lag. So the latest data is only through, uh, through uh, Q3 of last year. We don't get December until later this month. But what it shows is by current, not by country, but by currency, how much of the world's reserves are kept in dollars, how much in euros, how much in the other currencies. And roughly speaking, the dollar is about 60% of world reserves. The euro is a bit more than 20%. Mm -hmm. And so right there, you've got 80% of the world's reserves in the two currencies. And then as you go into a Japanese yen, British pound, you're talking about 2% or 3% of the world's reserves. Canadian dollars in there, the Australian dollars in there. Uh, so it is a diversified regime. So reserves are diversified mm -hmm. globally, but the dollar still is more than half of that. And I know people say, well, how can it be so when the dollar, when the U.S. economy is only about 20, 30 percent of the world's economy? Right. But what we often forget is many countries peg their currency to the dollar. So I'd say the dollar zone is much bigger than just the U.S. economy. 
I'd say Hong Kong's part of that, the Middle East is part of that, and the Chinese, even now, and when the, the tension between the U.S. and China, China's currency is very stable with the U.S. dollar. It almost shadows it. It's got the lowest, next to the Hong Kong dollar, which is literally pegged to the dollar, right. the, the Chinese currency hardly moves against the U.S. dollar. It's allowed to move theoretically in a 2% band around a reference rate that they set every morning. But it hardly even moves in half of that. It's unusual for it to even move a quarter percent in one day. When, like, when the Fed moved yesterday, uh, you've got the Aussie or the Euro moving by 1%. More than, so just to put that in perspective, the, yeah. the, so reserves are, are broad. There's about $11 trillion, $12 trillion of reserves globally. They're accumulated through uh, trade. They're accumulated through intervention. So if we, if, if we buy a Chinese good in the United States, that is going to effectively end up? Well, it, it, that's the way it used to be, because what would happen in China is that if you're, you're a Chinese bank and you just got dollars, you're forced to convert them right. with the central bank. Those kind of uh, restrictions have eased a little bit. And so China's reserves haven't really grown uh, any more than like valuation changes would allow for. And that's the other kind of key point, is that the reserves are reported in U.S. dollar terms. Mm -hmm. And so if, for example, the dollar strengthens, like it has been for the past year, you know, so that's a remarkable thing too, is that the U.S. dollar uh, bottoms, the euro tops out January 6, 2021. And we all know what was going on in Washington on January 6. Yeah, yeah. And that's when the dollar bottoms. The euro tops out that day. And, uh, and it's like so, a seesaw. A seesaw, exactly. And so because those reserves are reported in dollars, and when the dollar strengthens, the, euro, the dollar value of your euro reserves falls even though the central bank hasn't done anything. And that's really a key point, is that the reserves are not just kept in dollar bills. They're, bought, they're used to buy bonds. And the Federal Reserve right. acts as, as a custody for foreign central banks. And this is reported every Thursday with the money supply figures. And as of about a week ago or so, foreign central banks had about half of their global reserves in dollars sitting at the Federal Reserve as a custodian. A little bit more, they call it three and a half trillion dollars. And so, uh, so the reserves are held in bonds. And which they're is, actually now getting a little bit of a yield. They, finally. And, and so that's just the interesting thing. That, so behind the dollar role in the reserve asset sits the U.S. Treasury market, which, which is both liquid and perhaps getting more liquid every day with the deficits and getting deeper and broader. And so a large transaction is, uh, doesn't necessarily disrupt the market the way, you know, so when we have a refunding, for example, the, the, the U.S. government might sell $50 billion worth of, say, a two-year note. Mm -hmm. The European bond market, which, so the euro is the second most important reserve currency, the European bond market is like our U, like U.S. muni market. A lot of different issuers tend to be small, and they all have the different rules about how to right. trade them. So there's not really a market yet that's got the depth, breadth, and like homogeneity of the U.S. Treasury market. And what was back in the day British pound sterling, if we could go back? And, and how did it lose it, that status? Or, or how did Rome lose the status? Or, or the Dutch? Or the Portuguese? Or the Spanish? And yeah, isn't that amazing? This, we've, this is like the, in a, in a, an empire. It's sequentially, we're the eras of this it's, long It's incredible. Term. And it starts with Rome. Yes, but I'd say that the, the U.S. contribution, I'd say, is that Britain had the gold standard. Mm -hmm. it, it basically defended the gold standard. Uh, but that uh, other countries that had this, uh, say, uh, top dog status, mm -hmm. they were creditor nations. The U.S. has done it on debt. And the U.S. has been in debt for most of its history. Mm -hmm. And the, the debt is, I mean, the debt is, how do these dollars get off offshore that the, that the Chinese can have uh, more than a trillion dollars with the U.S. Treasury bonds? Well, part of those dollars go get it over abroad trade deficit that the U.S. runs, mm -hmm. broad current account deficit. It comes from international aid, like the Marshall Plan after World War II. That gave dollars to the world. Right. And so, so that a country like uh, uh, the Eurozone or Japan, they run, they, they, China, they run current account surpluses. So there's not a lot of those currencies floating around like there is dollars. And I, for me, that's like one of the smell tests. When I go to a different country, I often ask, even if I have the local currency, I'd ask the taxi driver if they take my dollars. I've never been refused. Yeah. I've tried asking for other currencies, and oftentimes I'm refused, especially if I ask for, say, I've got Mexican pesos, and there's, I haven't found a taxi driver in Europe that's willing to take my Mexican pesos. <laughs> Nor will you. <laughs> <laughs> he does. But that's a great example. I mean, that's a great way to illustrate it. And I, mean, I, lived, in, I lived in Venezuela for a while. They wanted my dollars um, at the time. I dare say they would mm -hmm. want dollars still today. Um, so, so, ex m let's get if we can into what 
happened with Russia. And because I, I, I believe that the Russian authorities thought that they had protected themselves or tried to prepare themselves to be protected against what has now happened uh, to their assets. And just walk through the import of the different holdings that they had, just based on what we were talking about. They had, they had drawn down to, I think, I think the US dollar reserves were just $100 billion. And Euro was twice that, and then gold. But at the same time, they still got completely frozen out. So I, like I'm a five-year-old, explain to me what happened in Russia and how Putin's best plans really have gone somewhat awry. Yeah, this is an amazing story. I think we're living through what's going to be a, a high water mark, like the Plaza Agreement in 1987, where the dollar got too strong and, and the, the G5 countries met at the Plaza Hotel not far from here and agreed to drive the dollar down. It was like a high water point of international cooperation. Yeah. And I think the same thing is happening now. So what, what did I Russia do? I was just do? there recently, by the way. Plaza, very good. Now it's condominiums, huh? <laughs> The, uh, the, the, so Russia know, knew that uh, it's been being sanctioned by the U.S. for a long time. And so mm -hmm. they realized that they were at risk, and so they reduced their dollar holdings. Mm -hmm. And like you say, they bought euros, they bought gold, and they thought that they were fairly safe, that, that uh, they were outside. Because what could the U.S. do? We cut off people and countries from accessing the dollar. And this is why China is really the Chinese banks are sticking to the sanctions because they don't want to be sanctioned themselves. Cut off of the dollar market. That's how important it is, the, sort of the, the lifeblood, really, of the world economy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, R Russia still had, uh, has reserves and they're, they're in other currencies, including the euro. And, the, and what happened was that as part of the sanctions, we froze them and we denied, but by we, I mean not just the US, but also Europe and other allies said, you cannot trade with the Russian central bank. Yeah. And so this was, we've done this to smaller countries, and we, we again, again, I mean the U.S. and many of our allies. Yeah, there was, uh, there was, there was South Vietnam, yeah. Iraq, Iran, yeah. North Korea. Yeah. So we've, we've done this before, but never to a country. I mean, Russia is still in the top, say, 10 or 12 countries as far as GDP. It's the 11th largest, largest economy. So this, yeah. was a, this was a little bit different. Than a different scale. And I think that some of these uh, other smaller countries were, I mean, basically what's happened is since 9-11, since the U.S. has used sanctions to try to go after terrorist financing. And it's mm -hmm. out of this, it's a very fat, rapid, a very large size of the Treasury that we don't really think about. We think about the Treasury printing debt or uh, issuing bonds and these kind of things. But they also are, uh, part of the Treasury is looking to try to cut down on the, uh, say, um, illegal financing for terrorism. And out of this comes the, the power of sanctions. And so Russia is the latest, uh, say, uh, subject of these sanctions. And they were bigger than people expected. They were broader. I don't think that even someone like myself, I'd say, who watches these things develop, is surprised by how quick the sanctions were, how broad they were, and how, how like deep they cut. Mm -hmm. So Russia had, say, roughly $350 billion in reserves, and it can't really touch most, most of it. Uh, there's some dispute how much they can touch. For example, besides buying euros and gold, it looked like they also bought some Chinese RMB. And oh, their their holdings were pretty. Their their holdings, I think, were almost the sa the same as, as they were of dollars. Yeah. So we yeah. So we that's what our sort of assumption I think in the market is that out of the something like three hundred billion dollars that are kept in RMB reserves, about ten percent or so is, is from Russia alone. And so so there might be so the uh, the sanctions on Russia are not are not airtight. There are some some gaps, mm -hmm. and I think that we're people in the market were watching this. What will China do? Well, China, China's got a swap line where they can, where Russia can get RMB in exchange for rubles. Like we have swap lines with other central banks. Russia has swap lines. And so we're watching, uh, our country's gonna take advantage of the, of the little holes that there might be in this sanction network. So, uh, so you, you, met, you mentioned mm -hmm. China, that, that's, that's the elephant in the room. How, mm -hmm. how do you think this episode Put your world history hat back on. Put your, you've been following the world order since your studies in, 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 at university. How do you think that, that, that this is playing out right now in Russia, kind of on a historic, excuse me, in China, kind of on a historical level? And, and how do you think that they perceive their position in terms of, because they des desperately want the yuan to be more accepted as a currency. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure that they've taken 
one step back and two steps forward with this episode in Russia. Yeah, because you got to remember that the Chinese currency is not convertible right now. That means that uh, you need permission to buy and sell Chinese currency. And we're talking about the currency on, in the mainland. They, they, we, we've created in the market, we've created an offshore RMB. Mm -hmm. We call it CNH because it trades because Hong Kong was its big base. And there's what we call also a non deliverable forward market. We say that, so that's like a parallel market that doesn't settle in RMB, but it settles in dollars. It just makes the offset. So if the, if the RMB falls 2%, well, you lose 2% on this non deliverable forward position, right. which the market's created to help uh, like uh, bypass. Uh, individual countries' regulations so that c companies and, and speculators can hedge themselves without necessarily having to go onshore. They're, they're kept whole because it's all settled in dollars. If I was in Beijing now, though, I don't know if I'd be very happy with what's going on. I think that in many ways what Russia has done is what many U.S. presidents have failed to do, to re revive NATO or reinvigorate NATO that uh, our last president talked about leaving NATO. I think the French president, who's running for re-election now, mm -hmm. talked about being brain dead a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And now NATO is not only not only has been reinvigorated, but maybe Finland and Sweden, who've been sitting on the sidelines, maybe they right. join. And Germany, the U.S. has been, several presidents have been like sort of like kicking Germany, saying, spend more money on defense, live up to your NATO obligation. And finally, Putin has gotten Germany to do that. And so I sort of see Europe coming together. And I think China, one of China's strategic plays was trying to f sort of create arbitrage room, uh, create some room between the US and Europe, which is harder to do. Going forward, uh, you saw what happened. Germany decided they need to uh, modernize their military. So they're going to be replacing the European-made fighter planes with US-made fighter planes. Mm -hmm. If Europe's going to be less dependent on Russian natural gas going forward, where are they going to get the gas from? The U.S. is going to be one of the major suppliers. So I see Europe and the U.S. coming closer together, mm -hmm. which must tick off Chinese. Oh, the that was their strategy. Well, they, mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, the, the number one recipient of foreign direct exchange outgoing uh, for China in recent years, it, it used to be the United States. That that since changed. Now it's become Europe. So they've invested a lot of money yes. in trying to create these fissures. And Germany trades more with China than it trades with the United States. So Germany is theoretically more economically dependent on China. And I think China liked that. Yes, I think this is the, uh, you know, we, that's the other thing that happened out of this, out of what Putin has done is that Nord Stream 2 pipeline that went from Russia to Germany is, uh, we try to, can't, we try to like sanction companies that were involved, sanction individuals that were involved. It's been going on for years. And, and now it's finally, it looks like now it's finally dead. And so, but I worry about other countries like that too. Australia, Japan, their biggest trading partner is China. And, and so, if I, so we can see what's happening. Countries like China, excuse me, uh, Australia, Japan, South Korea, especially now South Korea as a new president, mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be more willing to challenge uh, China as it's tried to, uh, expansion plans in, uh, in East Asia. Uh, if I, and I, if I was in Beijing too, I'd be worried that the, what's, what's happened is the world, I mean, not, not just the governments, which is an incredible response, but also companies. You think about Apple, Google, Coca-Cola, Disney, Sony, mm -hmm. pulling out. And these companies are willing to sacrifice short-term profitability, short-term revenues in order to make a point. And if I was China, I'd say, well, if I, go, if I was in Beijing right now, I think that the cost of me going into Taiwan just went up. Oh, yes. I mean, it, it definitely has. And, you know, by the same token, you know, there, there, there's, there have, there's been some rumblings on the street, on Wall Street, that, that we crossed, that we, that we crossed a, a line. And I, I wrote about this, and, and you, you've read it, but that we crossed a line by, by freezing up these reserves. That, that you can't kind of pseudo default on such a large chunk of U.S. treasuries without raising some eyebrows and, and having people question kind of the sanctity of the risk free asset of the world. Yeah, I think people, I think that there is, people are concerned, but it's sort of like, you know, in the U.S., unlike most of the, uh, say, high-income countries, we mm -hmm. have the death penalty. But we, well, you and I walk around the street, we're not worried that the death penalty is going to be used against us. And the same kind of thing that I think that countries know that what Russia did was cross a big line. And that crossing that big line, obviously, it wasn't in 2008 when they took Georgia, because we whined and cried about it, put on some sanctions, but did nothing, really. Right. Then 2014, Russia goes into Ukraine, takes Crimea. We, we whine about it, we put some sanctions on, still nothing. And so it seems perfectly rational to go to that cookie jar a third time. And, and what, what a shock it must have been. Uh, and so I, I think that 
Well, I, it helps that the president of, of Ukraine has become, a, a, you know, this was, social media wasn't what it was back then. And now he's like a social media he's, hero. He's a star. He's like, I mean, but he's become a sex symbol even. And I think that it's... Uh, That's a bit much, but okay. <laughs> Jewish comedian, what can you do? Yeah, yeah. But I think that the... Uh, uh, that the problem, I think, ultimately, is that people might raise the questions about it. And I, I, you know, in most of my most of my career, I, I can almost periodize it, not necessarily by the banks I've worked for, but by uh, the different currencies that were going to replace the dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late '90s, the euro was born. Actually, before that, even the beginning of my career, Japan was was oh, was eating J up the whole world. Japan was buying the plaza. It was bought the plaza. It bought Rockefeller Center. Pebble and, Beach. And so, right, people thought the yen. The, Jap the, the, uh, the yen was going to replace the dollar. That, of course, proved nothing. And the, uh, then it was going to be the advent of the euro. So the, the Europeans get together, they have their common currency. Now, I've been to Europe a lot. I always thought they had a common currency, American Express. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but but, but so, so they developed their own currency. And we thought, OK, now they've got a currency, the, the deep market, they'll replace the dollar. And the euro today, as a reserve currency, is not even bigger than the sum of its parts. The sum of its parts, the Deutsche Mark, the French franc, the Belgian franc, yeah. add them all together, they were about 23% of world reserves. The euro is not there. And so, and, and then people are saying that- Well, I think on a fundamental level, you never, there is no, there is no equivalent to a treasury in, yeah. in Europe, holistically, as right. a whole. Right, and so, and so, so for countries like Canada, for example, which is we we in the U.S. buy some like eighty or ninety percent of what they export. Their their reserves are diversified. They have they don't have eighty percent dollars in reserves. They have something closer to sixty percent of dollars in reserves. Mm -hmm. And so small countries can diversify their reserves. Countries like China with three trillion dollars in reserves. What's big enough to absorb that? And the idea that China could. What can China do? It can't adopt the RMB as its reserve because it's their own currency. And, and imagine if they say, okay, we'll, we'll buy German bunds instead. German bund yields are less than one percentage point. Mm -hmm. uh, so to, to buy bunds... And that's, more, that, that's on a good day. That's, yeah. what about 12 months ago? Yeah, right, but they've been negative for, for years. Exactly. Right? So for, 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 another cur so for, for China to say, we'll, or Saudi Arabia, to put their reserves in, in a wholesale way into Europe, they're giving up yield, they're giving up transparency, they're giving up liquidity. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that uh, for large countries who have accumulated reserves, maybe too much reserves, they're stuck. And it's like, uh, they're stuck with the dollar. I don't see a real alternative. And so I, I guess you're saying that the, the, the splashy headlines that Saudi Arabia was going to be speaking to China about, you know, trying to take, take petrodollar off of its throne and haven't we been having these discussions or haven't we haven't we seen these headlines before exactly these kind of issues keep coming up and that's why i point out that the that after the federal reserve raised interest rates the saudis had to raise interest because they despite the, the falling out between the u.s and saudi arabia over a number of issues iran afghanistan mm -hmm. oil prices terrorist financing terrorist financing yeah so so saudis have saudis have diverged from u.s interests and still they peg their currency to the dollar and partly it's been a great source of stability for them and so if they were to give that up now, it would, be, it, it would, it would cause a, perhaps an economic crisis at home. It would be a very like a disjoint or like a, an inflection point. So I, I think that, that, that the idea of uh, another reserve asset, and I, I share that concern that uh, overplaying the sanction hand makes people want to have an alternative even more. So that's why we jump around to the next shiny object. There was someone in the Financial Times who tried to suggest it should be Bitcoin, and like El Salvador has done. And I just don't see this as, I mean, the dollar is just, the, 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 the size of these things are just, scales are incomparable. Well, and that's the thing, right? I mean, it's, so let, let's, let's touch on crypto for a little, it's not part of my world, um, which, gosh, my people on my Twitter feed can't stand it. <laughs> are you finally turning to the Bitcoin side? No. Um, but, but on a fundamental level, I think there's a lack of understanding in the sense that there's no transacting on, on, a, on a grand scale. I mean, this, the idea that, that you could have a, a, a kind of a, a global agreement that we're going to punish the dollar, throw it out, and we're going to bring this cryptocurrency in to replace it. It just it doesn't hold water. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, it's just, again, the scale is off. The, the, for me, the, 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 the thing with crypto is that the way it should work is money, is that people would use it. But if you think that fiat money the money the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank's creating is not backed by gold or silver. It's ultimately just paper being printed. Then right. you say, well, okay, then I'm going to hold on to my Bitcoin. But the more you hold on to your crypto, 
the less you're going to use it for networking and to use it for, for buying things. You're going to hold on to it. It's like, it's like the Gershom's Law, right? That good, bad money chases out good money in the mm-hmm. sense that you hold on to that what you think is going to be value. Crypto, right. so you, you spend your dollars, but you don't spend your crypto, which means it doesn't get that networking effect to make it real money. It sort of reminds me of Esperanto. Remember that, that language people came up with that was supposed to be a replacement, a universal language? And nobody uses it, really. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. This, I'm sure you're going to get emails saying, oh, but I use it. Esperanto, people, it was invented to be a universal language, but nobody uses it. It's, it's, it's not like a natural outgrowth. And that's no. why I think to your point that there, there could be a, a natural outgrowth where companies, countries try to look for different payment systems. They, okay, we kicked Russia off of SWIFT, so maybe we should have a different payment system, but Europe has a different one, China has one, but not used that much. No, I mean, I, when, when you look at, at, at CIPS, SIPS, um, yes, yeah, that's, that's the, 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 the system, that, uh, the, the settlement system in, in, China. in China. Only for the RMB, though. The RMB's got to be part of those trades. Right. And so it really limits what they can do. Exactly. You know, I am intrigued, though, because you're you, trading in, in the yuan, and I know I'm saying it, I should be saying RMB, but um, it's been kind of steadily somewhere around 2 3% of mm-hmm. global transactions, and it's just skipped up. Uh, in the past few months, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm curious about whether or not you think it's going to continue to slowly rise as a factor of time. I, I, I think because China, yeah. I, I don't think anybody disputes that. Given my world, given what the Federal Reserve is doing to this economy, I don't. I, I think it's indisputable that China is going to continue to rise as as an economy vis-a-vis that of the United States. Yeah, I think that's definitely what the Chinese believe. They think that the U.S. is in some kind of uh, like uh, uh, decline that can't be uh, can't be arrested. I I, th- I think that if we were playing poker, and you could you'd let me play anybody's hands, U.S. cards, Europe's cards, China's cards. I think I'd take the U.S. cards. China still has China. Like I say, the currency is not convertible. Well, no, no, no. I, I'm not talking about I, I'm not talking about the, the the Chinese currency. I'm just saying that they continue to. The, the size of their economy continues to grow. Yeah, so you think about the size of the economy, right? So China is, uh, roughly speaking, 1.3 trillion people. Mm-hmm. Actually, 1.3 billion people. Billion people, yeah. And the U.S. is, say, 375 million people. Mm-hmm. And yet our economy is bigger. And so eventually, over time, you'd expect that China, through coming up with its own technology, stealing other people's technology... They're good at that. ...that, that they're going to close the gap. And eventually they might. Eventually, I mean, maybe... In the next decade or so, many people project the Chinese economy to be bigger than the U.S. economy. Mm-hmm. But think about what's happened in the last 20 years even. The commanding heights of this new economy, Facebook, Google, Amazon, there's nothing comparable. They have their own versions of things like the knockoffs of it, but there's nothing so universal. And we were the first ones the there. The knockoffs have been knocked off, yes. Yeah, but we're still the... We're still the uh, our economy uh, may not be the biggest in the world going forward. But we're but still the biggest innovator. We're the innovator. And, and I think, that, I mean, so, so we might not make many colored televisions here, though we invented it. Mm-hmm. And so over time, yes, China is developing its own, its own uh, patent library. And especially for when we think about like digital currency, like China's launching, they've got a lot of the key patents. And so, yeah, China is a serious rival that we haven't had before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, I think it's a bit too early to, to figure out who's going to win this one. Speaking of uh, trying to help us mm-hmm. win or trying to help us lose, what... What is your view on the evolution of, of my former employer, the Federal Reserve, and how it's how how the hand that it has played in this economy has affected our medium long term prospects? Yeah, so I think that uh, I, I agree with uh, like some most of, like a lot of your analysis that the uh, the Federal Reserve should have been tightening before this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of compared it to uh, for me. I know you had said something about the, uh, the buying the mortgage-backed securities when you got housing prices skyrocketing, and I, I sort of compared them buying these the inflation-linked securities, the tips. Oh yeah. And then telling us what the tips market was saying about their job on inflation. I kind of compared it to a butcher with its thumb on the scale. And uh, so I, 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 but I think that uh, that's, well, that's of, what most people don't appreciate is that the Fed was actually crafting the inflation narrative before. The actual inflation genie got out of the bottle. Yes, they, were, they were trying to push the idea that inflation was going to rise by intervening in that market effectively. Yes, I, so I, I, so I, I think the Fed, like, yeah, I would, I would say, yeah, Fed's guilty of of these uh, of staying like too loose for too long. Uh, but I think that where we are now is a tough position because I think that on one, there's two horns of a dilemma, and I think that uh, people like myself, perhaps like you, 
uh, we, uh, we criticize the Fed as it jumps from one of the horns of the dilemma to the other. First, they're behind the curve, but then if they tighten, they're going to be risking a recession. And that's what I think, you know, yesterday after the Fed, after the Fed raised rates, the, uh, the five and 10 year curve got inverted briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's back a little bit positive now, but I think we have to be careful that the curve is going to get inverted, which is why some people think that the Federal Reserve may rely more on its balance sheet reduction than on hikes. So we don't see that from, uh, from, what, the, from what Powell said yesterday. No, he said that, he said that the Fed would, would address the balance sheet in coming meetings. There wasn't even, I mean, I, I think that there was somewhat of an anticipation at least that we would, they would indicate that May would be kind of launch date. And he didn't, he didn't even want to go there. Yeah, so I, I think that the market is, where the market's at now, I'd say the market thinks it's going to happen between May, the May meeting, and maybe June or July. So sometime in those three months, which might be close enough for what the market needs right now. And I think that we also know roughly the size. He said one is look back to what we did before. But the other thing is that uh, at the Federal Reserve, they, uh, the woman who runs the Fed's open market operations. Lori Logan. Larry Logan. She said that uh, she, she gave the market the, uh, like the, uh, the range of maturities for both the treasuries and these mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like something like, uh, uh, my, my guess would be like 60 to $80 billion a month between the treasuries and the agencies will be allowed to roll off. Mm -hmm. And so the balance sheet gets reduced. Uh, by uh, by letting these maturing issues not re not reinvesting the proceeds, right. rather than like what some other central banks like New Zealand is going to do, they're going to actually be selling some out of it outright. The Bank of England says when they get to their base rate to one percent, today it got up to seventy five basis points. Mm -hmm. Let's say when it gets up to one percent, they could also begin selling. Right. We'll see if they really do and or this not. This is kind of a a, a Voldemort, um, for lack of a better mm -hmm. you know description. This is kind of a no man's land. I mean. It, it, in speaking with Richard, he's like, there's one thing we don't do, we don't sell. Yeah, I think that, so this is, I think, the, the interesting, like, historical analogy is that in the Great Depression, countries discovered their, their balance sheet, federal deficits. We've been more or less running a federal deficit since then, and many other countries are too. Mm -hmm. I think in the Great Financial Crisis, central banks discovered their own balance sheets. So the federal government had their balance sheet, and some people thought that had gone too far with it, over 100% in many countries. And then, so during the Great financial crisis, when interest rates got close to zero, central banks discovered their balance sheets. And I think it's one of those tools. It's a whole different way to think about it, but okay. I mean, I mean you're, you're actually opening my eyes to a different, because I was on the inside when this happened, and it was, but, but that's a really fun way to think about it. They discovered their balance sheets. I'm just, I'm just capturing yeah. this. Yep, and so I, I think what happens then is that it's, one is when you give, as you know, right, when you give politicians a tool, it's hard to take it back. Uh -huh. And so, not that the Federal Reserve are politicians, but they are political actors. And I think that it's hard to get, uh, when the central bank has discovered this power, they're reluctant to just give it up. It's normalized. And one way it's become normalized, and this is why another reason I fault the Fed for being slow to, to take it back, is that it's going to be normalized. You've got to put it on quickly. You've got to take it back quickly. And I think that there's a sense of this, but it's, still, it's only the second time they've used it. And the bank, of, and we did it much quicker this time, assuming that they, they un begin unwinding. Right. In the, in the middle of the middle of this year sometime it's much faster than they did in the last time around that's true that's true i mean and, and he he accelerated the pace and and they're out uh but yet they're still reticent to take that next step yes i and i think that yeah i think that partly because many people don't understand the, ch the different channels on which you can act on many people focus on it called quantitative quantitative tightening mm -hmm. and yet it seems to me that the you know uh, again, it's from international, from doing the currencies. I see Japan has slowed down its buying of equities. I mean, we never bought equities. Japan bought equities. They bought, I think, I want to say they bought everything, including like high yield bonds, what we'd call junk bonds, uh, bought corporate bonds. They bought everything, I think, but my comic book collection. <laughs> and yet, yet, no one talked, if they slowed down, no one called it tapering. And the reason they don't call it tapering is because they, I think that the most effective channel on which unwinding takes place is communications. The communication channel. So, if the Federal, if Bank of Japan says we're reducing our buying because we want to keep, continue to go longer, mm -hmm. right. we're on a more sustainable path. And so, I think the, the, if the Federal Reserve were to say uh, we're going to be letting the balance sheet unwind, but we have no intention on uh, maybe they have no intention. Maybe they'd say we still want to rely on the Fed fund as our primary tool for monetary policy. And so, put. The, and so, I think Powell has said a couple times about putting QT, the unwinding of the balance sheet in the background. That's not the key part of policy. And I, there's a debate about this, but there's a debate even about whether the QE really works. And Bernanke had a clever way of saying it. He said, it works in practice, but not in theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Uh, well, it certainly works mm -hmm. in terms of transmissions channel to, to the to, to the markets. Um, but but you know, back in that quantitative tightening era, I think that one of the things that Fed policymakers struggled with was the, the backdrop outside the United States. So there were negative interest rates in the, um, at, at the time. And, and because there were negative interest rates, there was this mad rush into physical currency. And so you had foreign holdings at the Fed increasing at the same time that currency in circulation was increasing. And that was equal to the effect of the Fed's letting assets roll off. And I think that that was completely misunderstood. And now we hear about Nigeria and you know, it's, it's gotten rid of its currency or it's got, it, it can't service its debt in dollars. So it looks like there's gonna be a crisis there immediately. And so, but explain what happens mechanistically when people outside the United States are rushing to find $100 bills. Yeah, isn't it amazing? This is, so we follow this in the foreign exchange market. It's one of these stress tests. You know, early in our careers, we look at the TED spread, T-bills, which are gov backed by the U.S. government, against euro dollars, uh -huh. which, are, which are deposits at a bank. And so you have, it's a, it's a credit spread. Mm -hmm. And so one of, those, one of those things that we, in the markets that we look at is the ability to, to shift liquidity from a foreign currency into dollars, cross-currency swap basis. Mm -hmm. And so it, to, to, exactly to your point that this measure shows that it's become more difficult for countries to secure their dollar funding. So why do, and this is part of the reason the dollar plays such a role. Companies and countries outside the U.S. issue dollar bonds. They have to do dollar financing for their trade. There's right. a lot of different functions. And so well, they need I mean, the dollars. Well, if you consider, I mean, you know, I don't think people quite appreciate why Turkey is constantly in the headlines, the country of Turkey. And they've got a massive corporate bond market in dollars. Exactly. Denominated in dollars. Many, many countries, because they, bar they, they borrow, Turkey borrows dollars. They probably don't have an RMB bond. We might call it a panda bond. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, so so that when there's, a, when there's a, uh, a problem in the world, those people who are short the dollar because they owe the dollar, meaning that they're short the dollar, they have to scramble to get that dollar funding. Right. In a way, they don't have to do it for China. They do it a little bit for the yen, a little bit for the Swiss franc. So that's why they, they've got this like aura of being safe havens. But what they're really doing is people in the financial markets and the capital markets, they're borrowing yen, they're borrowing Swiss francs, they're borrowing dollars and buying another high yielding asset, mm -hmm. Turkish bonds, emerging market equities. And then when those, when, which invariably does, those emerging market equities or those high risk bonds, they go south, you have to liquidate those and you have to buy back that funding currency. Mm -hmm. So that's what gives it this appearance of a safe haven. So it's, it's, again, it's the, dollar, the role of the dollar, the plumbing of the system. It's not that the do people like the dollar because they like the United States or we have nuclear weapons. They, it's not about liking, it's, that it's, it's a necessity. They've borrowed the dollars, now they gotta pay them back. And the access to dollars becomes a metric of how much stress there is in the system. How much are they willing to pay over LIBOR or over short-term interest rate to get their dollars? So, um Speaking of the dollar, what, what's your outlook for the dollar? Yeah, the amazing thing is we all think that like we have this idea in our mind, Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. The dollar is going to go up. And of course, this is like, I want to say this is the uh, sort of, a, I want to say it's a retail type version of what happens. Because what happens in the markets, and this is one of the things I love about the markets, in most of our lives, most parts of our lives, cause takes place before the effect. But in the financial markets, we're anticipating things. So many people anticipated, because it was so well telegraphed, the Federal was gonna raise interest rates. Right. And, and not just now, but in past cycles, the Federal Reserve has indicated the tightening's coming, they tighten, and what typically happens? The dollar rallies before they tighten, it sells off during the tightening phase. The BIS, the Bank for National Settlements, who created to collect war reparations from Germany after World War I, now they become the Central Bankers Bank. Right. They keep track of these kind of things. And they say that in one of their research papers that in the past four cycles, the dollar has fallen during the Fed's tightening by an average of about 4%. And I, I, I trust that. I mean, I trust the logic of that sure. as well. So I kind of think what happens is the market anticipates the Fed to raise interest rates. We buy the, we buy the rumor. We sell the fact, and then why, why, why do we want to sell the fact that the Fed's raising interest rates? And this, I think, is another point that you and I probably share, is that the Federal Reserve is, uh, has a horrible track record at, at, at exactly what Powell and the dot plots yesterday suggested. They're going to engineer a soft landing. I say that if it was a horse, I wouldn't want to bet on it. 
because they, they have a poor track record. So what the market's pricing in is they're saying, and I think that's what the yield curve is telling us right. as well, is they're saying the Federal Reserve waited too long to raise rates, and now they have to raise rates in a, in a weakening economy, and they're going to drive us into recession. Well, I, I think we're seeing. Uh, I mean, I think we're seeing that in credit in, in credit markets, which are starting to get really nervous. Yes, uh, yeah, I see it through the yield curve. I see it through, uh, like you say, the credit spreads, mm -hmm. uh, because when, when interest rates are near zero, and the Fed is promising to be lower for longer, uh, why not buy high yielding assets? And any uh, any junk bond issuer can come to market and refinance what they've got. But I mean, there's, I think I saw yesterday there's a trillion dollars trillion dollars in in corporate bonds to be refinanced globally, non-financials, this year alone. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. And I think too about the uh, uh, the low interest rates, the negative interest rates. I mean, even today, there's still negative interest rates in some countries, that part of their bond market, primarily in Europe and a bit in Japan. And yet, uh, how can this be? Negative interest rates. I mean, I can understand. I go to an ATM that's not my bank, and they, I take a hundred dollars out, and they charge me two or three dollars. That's like a negative interest rate. But imagine on a bigger scale, we're talking about trillions of dollars of negative yielding bonds. And so I think that it's hard for me to, to like, it's sort of like we walked through Alice in Wonderland's looking glass. Yeah. And here we are, negative interest rates. Like, even in Greece for a while, they had negative interest. You had to give, you had to pay Greece for the privilege of lending them your money. Which, I mean, that just makes my, it makes my head turn into a pretzel. I just, <laughs> it's just, it's so, um, so we, we, we discovered in this recent episode how, how precarious the situation was in the commodities market because commodities was, this is, I'm sure you read Zoltan Pozar's piece, Bretton Wood Three, um, but that, that, that commodities were, were the collateral behind a lot of transactions. And we didn't see that until wheat futures went up to the moon and then nickel froze in trading on the London Metals Exchange. And um, I bring that up because I'd love for you to contextualize the size of the foreign exchange markets and compare that to other asset markets in the world. Yes, it's so amazing. That's why I, that's, you know, I love the foreign exchange market. My, my week begins Sunday afternoons when Australia and New Zealand open. Yep. And it finishes about 5 o'clock on Fridays when New York essentially closes. Right. And uh, so it's a 24-hour-a-day market, and it's uh, six days a week. And increasingly, as we begin integrating more of the Middle East, and uh, other countries, uh, they'll be trading uh, seven days a week. Uh, they don't take off necessarily both days of, the, of our, what we no, consider our weekends. No, I know, I'll turn on Bloomberg on the weekends sometimes and I'll catch like some live show from, being from Saudi Arabia, yeah. a live Bloomberg. Yeah, this is where I think that the Zoltan's argument sort of falls apart for me is that, yes, commodities are important, trade is important, but what moves the dollar tends not to be trade. And the, the zero hedge keeps calling the dollar the petrol currency. We call that like the transactional demand for dollars. Where does China get the dollars to buy the oil? They don't have to buy those dollars. They get the dollars from the trade surplus. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so yes, commodities are important. Yeah. And we can see this especially, and we saw this in oil in 2020. Oil prices go negative. And the same thing happened in Russia recently. One of their, one of their oil uh, benchmarks went negative. So in a physical delivery market, you can have that. But a lot of markets, I think this is what we're learning about in commodities trading, mm -hmm. is, is the physically deliverable markets where you, you, you take a delivery of the soybean contract, you've got to deliver a car full of soybeans. Right. Instead, cash delivery, cash settlement. So you settle the different, settling really the balances. And I think that the, the physical, uh, especially in, in today's day where it's so volatile and where you can have sanctions or these other things can happen. In Nichols case, it was partly because of Russia, because Russia uh, sort of uh, created uh, this shortage in effect by, by this Russian sanctions and a large producer was caught short. It was a powerful short squeeze that, mm -hmm. was, that was destabilizing. And so the way to, I think that we're learning, I think that in the future, we're gonna have more dollar settled or currency settled contracts rather than uh, physical settlement. Right. And, but we see this, I mean, and, and so for example, the, the Chinese have a, an oil contract that's denominated in RMB. The Japanese have the only rubber futures contract denominated in the yen. Doesn't make those currencies a greater share of the world's uh, trading as an invoicing currency or as a reserve currency. So I, I think that well, commodities are important. What really drives the dollar are things that influence the capital markets. That's why I really read your stuff. It's because we were talking about U.S. interest rates, U.S. policy, the credibility of that policy. Yeah. What, attracts, what attracts money into the U.S.? It's not that oil that the Saudis sell to China is denominated in dollars. Ultimately, what drives it is what's, I think, in many ways, we are our own worst enemy and we are our best friend. What drives money into the U.S., why the U.S. is able to prosper 
as a debtor, borrowing world savings is because is, is the things that attract the rule of law, transparency of our markets. And yes, of course, it's not perfect. And there's all kinds of, uh, all kinds of like backsliding from these things. But relative to other countries, it's still the markets are most transparent. I mean, think about these rules that, you know, the Fed gets caught in this uh, improper trading issues. And yet other countries, I mean, not only do our Congress people and our judges not adhere to those rules, accept to those rules, but most other countries don't have those same rules. We apply rules to the Federal Reserve. They don't live under them. We raise the bar. And so that's why I think that the, what ultimately drives the dollar, the $6.6 .6 trillion a day foreign exchange market, is not the flow of goods, but the flow of capital. Where, where is the risk in the system, in your view? The risk we can't see. Yeah, I, 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 the risk that I've been working on, that I've been thinking a lot about, is not a risk that plays well on Wall Street. Because on Wall Street, you can have too much of anything but money. But yet, there's a story about a, a young man who's taking a half of a pig home to his family on a motorcycle in China. And he gets hijacked, and they let him keep the motorcycle. Pork was more expensive, it was worth more. And why? Same reason why what was happening with oil, supply and demand. And so to me, the only reason you can have interest rates at zero for such a long period of time, interest rates negative in, in parts of the world, is that there's too much capital. And I know many of us on Wall Street, we think of too much debt, maybe but not too much capital. Mm -hmm. Yet, debt, de the asset and liability is really, you know, the U.S. sells a bond and it becomes a U.S. liability. I have it on my books, it's an asset. And so too much money is the same thing as saying there's too much debt, too much capital. And I think that's ultimately the problem is, you know, uh, it used to be a recession would wash it out. But, we, but for in mm -hmm. modern democracies, but not just in modern democracies, you see what's going on in China. They don't even have a recession and they're already like screaming uncle, right? They want to give us some more stimulus. And so I think that in our modern way of thinking is we want to protect, we want to put a, f a shelf or a floor underneath the recessions. And as opposed to like what Mellon said during the Great Depression, liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. We don't have the, I don't think we have the stomach or the consciousness for this anymore. No, we don't. But, but, but the implications for long-term productivity are, they're just, they're, they're, not, they're not good. I, I, I guess, I mean, in, in, in the biggest picture, I think, I think, I think my last question yeah. would be kind of, do we say debt and deficits don't matter? And you can go back, as you said, a century in the United States, where that's kind of been the standard operating. I mean, it's, it's been how we've existed. It, is there a level that is, can we have too much debt in the United States? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a typical American in this regard, is that uh, most, of, most, most people like myself, we're gonna spend our lives in debt, whether it's student loans, car loans, mortgages, I think that uh, I think the American attitude. So Germany and the and Netherlands, the, the word for debt and guilt, are have the same root word. That's that's not a, the American approach. I think the American approach is debt is okay as long as you can service it. And today I'd say that with interest rates, I mean here we are talking about close to eight percent inflation, and a two and a ten year bond yield at say around two percent. Real rates are very low, and I think that if if people were concerned that the U.S. couldn't pay back its debt. I don't think we'd see real rates so, so, so much below zero. Mm -hmm. So I think that per, perhaps it's like uh, what, they said, uh, what the Supreme Court justice said about pornography, that he doesn't know it until he sees it. Right. And I think the same thing about that debt limit. is It, it seems reasonable that there'd be some limit. At some point we'd say, this and no more. Uh, but the U.S. is not Brazil. The U.S. is not Greece. The U.S. is not, so I, I think the U.S. is in a unique position. But I think other countries uh, that are large economies also have large debt. And I think this is sort of the um, sort of uh, characteristic of modernity. But yes, I, I agree with you that at some point, what are we going to do? We're going to give our children and our grandchildren uh, a lot of debt and a weakening, in, uh, given the environmental changes and everything. We're going to give them a bad world, a, a world in which we're not really dealing with the problems. We're really passing them on. Right. Well. But at least we innovate, right? We innovate. We'll come up with a solution. Even if, it's, even if it's somehow, I mean, I think that's the issue, right? Is how, how, can we, how do we deal with a surplus of capital? So what, what do you tell your students? Because you also teach, I teach here in yes. the city. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, I, I try to avoid like uh, sharing my pessimism about the future. Because after all, I grew up in Chicago and I'm still a Cubs fan. And it's always like next year they'll do it. You are an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at heart, I'm an optimist. But I think this is like true to the American spirit. I mean, you think about like uh, what we've done. I, I think about like uh, going to the moon. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the innovations, the, uh, the computers, the uh, incredible innovation. And so it's not that tech I'm not like saying that technology is going to solve all of our problems. I think that having a, an economy and a society in which people can freely debate generates if, if, that, if that basis of not being necessarily right, but being able to find the right answer. Mm -hmm. That gives me the hope about that, well, that these problems aren't crippling. And even as we sit here today, I mean, the, the dollar, the, the foreign central banks never had as many dollars as they do today. Uh, the U.S. economy has never been larger than it is today. Yep. Uh, of course, we have all kinds of distributional issues that might, might limit our growth going forward. But we, if, if, so the, for the Chinese, or maybe Russians now, who think the U.S. is in, or the U.S. or the West is in some kind of inexorable decline, Say, I read that book too. Over 100 years ago, there was a book about the decline of the West. And uh, we're still here. Well, that's a happier note to end on. Let's, <laughs> let's, let, let's end it there. And I'd love to visit with you in another year or so. And we can talk about how the world has changed and whether or not the Fed has even come close to normalizing. <laughs> but I really appreciate all your time today. Thank you for being with me. Thank you. Enjoyed it. So uh, a lot of you viewers out there like to throw acronyms out at me that I don't understand. And now I can throw one at you. Now you get what FX is. So remember it, the letter F, the letter X. And if you found that to be intriguing, and if the idea of the West coming back together, of using this Russia-Ukraine moment uh, to galvanize ourselves, to realign our allies, if that appeals to you, then be sure and go back and watch my recent interview with Jonathan Ward, Dr. Jonathan Ward. He, he has so many great insights on how the United States and the West can maintain their position of supremacy going forward. So uh, until the next time, this is Daniel DiMartino Booth with Down the Middle. Thank you for your time.